Hello and welcome to the Business Standard Morning Show. I'm Ishan Gera and here are the stories for the day. Ramu, do chai de yaar. Are nahi yaar, ek chai coffee. We Indians disagree on everything. But we agree, SBI is the banker to every Indian. SBI is the home loan. I agree with you. SBI is the banker to every Indian. After two years of lull, regular international flights will resume from India beginning March 27th. It will replace the expensive air bubble arrangement with 37 countries, giving a big breather to travellers. So what does it mean for the aviation and tourism industry? Will it help them recover from the pandemic woes? Watch our next report to know more. Like the rest of the world, India had also put a halt on international passenger flights when the first wave of the pandemic struck two years ago. Regular international flights were first banned for a week starting March 23, 2020, but it stretched to two years. In between, more than 20,000 employees across airlines and ground handling agencies have lost their jobs in the last two years. The government had earlier planned to lift the ban on December 15th last year but another wave poured cold water on it. Now, India has announced to resume scheduled international passenger flights from March 27th. The resumption of such flights now will mean an end to the temporary air bubble arrangements that India negotiated with many countries starting July 2020. India currently has reciprocal air transport bubbles with 37 countries including the US, Canada, UAE and the UK. Airlines were allowed to operate only a limited number of flights to these countries and the tickets were expensive. The government's move to start regular flights will boost international capacity and help soften airfares which have been soaring due to increased demand and rise in crude oil prices. International routes also mean higher revenue earned per seat. On Tuesday, there were 584 international flights which is less than 50% of pre-COVID capacity. Despite the government allowing domestic airlines to operate at 100% capacity, Indigo had a few planes grounded in its 270 aircraft fleet. Indigo CEO Ranojay Datta said the government's step will provide an impetus to the sector's recovery. The airline will soon announce its schedule for international destinations. As domestic travel rebounded, airlines were eagerly waiting for unrestricted international travel to restart. Indigo and SpiceJet posted surprise profits in the October to December period after seven quarters. Yeah, so uh, I think this is a uh, this is a very positive news for the industry. I think everyone is accepting that. Uh, on the airfare side, I would I would answer it by saying that yes, there is going to be a reduction in the airfare for sure, and primarily this reduction is going to be on the basis of the fact that you have a, a significant amount of capacity that can be brought back into the international market. The restrictions that the air bubble agreements had posted, uh, or those are going to be going out. And net net, yes, I understand that the fuel price has gone up, uh, but the sheer amount of capacity that needs to be added. See, airlines have bled a lot. Airlines have had a cash negative cash flows for a long time. So the focus at this point of time would not be really profitability from an airline perspective but that would just be to increase the cash flows and and start getting a significant amount of cash into uh, cash in the register uh, so i think uh, the idea at least for the next 2 to 3 months by airlines is going to be pump in capacity uh, lower the fares get more people flying in uh, so that you can you can at least start the cash register ringing uh, rather than the profitability of the rules so uh, that is the reason why I feel that the that net net the fares are going to be lower. The latest announcement provides a glimmer of hope for the hospitality industry too, which was among the hardest hit during the pandemic. 20 to 30 percent of hotels and restaurants in India are estimated to have permanently shut down since 2020. Tourism and hospitality sector is a major foreign exchange earner for India. It brought in 30 billion dollars in 2019, but this declined sharply in 2020. So presently, uh, the domestic is the only business that is happening uh, right now. And this business is, as you know, it is, it's more predominantly happening in the resort and the uh, 
holiday destinations and it's not really helping the the big cities second cities and the corporate uh, the destinations or corporate hotels to say so what is very critical uh, is that that hotels although they are having demand from domestic uh, travelers the demand does not really satisfy the revenue requirement of the industry operation of scheduled flights is something that we've been requesting the central government mha for a long time and uh, we are very very happy that this has finally come by this will really bring in the necessary uh, revenue generation for the industry which is required to to mitigate all the problems that they've been facing for the last two years. Uh, although the pandemic eased, although the relaxation eased, it really did not translate into anything uh, good for the industry simply because the scheduled flights were not operating. So with now, the all the scheduled flights of most of the international uh, um, arrivals will start. We are hoping that we'll come back to the pre-pandemic levels and this is one of the final signs uh, which could really lift the morale. India's vibrant medical tourism industry will also get a boost. The industry was expected to reach $9 billion in 2020, but it did not happen due to the pandemic. Large private hospitals get 10 to 15% of their revenues from medical tourism. From nearly 7 lakh in 2019, foreign tourists arriving for medical treatment in India fell 73% to 1.82 lakh in 2019. The industry has recovered to half of its pre-COVID size last year and this is expected to gather pace. With the last of the restrictions on tourism now being lifted, it will have a multiplier effect on various service-oriented sectors. Open skies will turn the fortunes of aviation industry in the long run. But right now, a sharp rise in the prices of jet fuel due to Russia-Ukraine war may prove to be a dampener for the industry as it accounts for almost 40% of airlines' operating cost. Sab achhi dikh rahi hain yaar. Kaun si kare dun? Ye to wahi baat hui. 4000 shares listed hai. Kaun sa lu? Wo to sabse aasan hai. Tujhe 5 paisa nahi pata? Shh. Ab to sabko pata hai. Five Pesa par hai 4,000 stocks ki research, technical tools aur investment ideas. Download Five Pesa now. Ab to sab ko pata hai. Investing made easy and rewarding with Five Pesa. Investments in securities market are subject to market risks. Read all the related documents carefully before investing. In the winter of 2015, way before it attacked Ukraine, it is alleged that hackers backed by Russia had breached the power grid knocked out the electricity and plunged parts of Western Ukraine into darkness. Similar attacks have since happened across the world. So is India prepared to safeguard its critical infrastructure in case of cyber attack by state or non-state actors? Our next report offers a peek. According to business and consumer data company Statista, in financial year 2021, over 3.8 thousand government services in India were provided over the internet. A CLSA report indicates the value of digital payments in India will grow threefold, close to $1 trillion in FY26 from $300 billion in FY21. A Deloitte study has said India will have 1 billion smartphone users by 2026. The country was home to 1.2 billion mobile subscribers in 2021, of which about 750 million were smartphone users. As of January 2021, India had 448 million social media users. In 2021, the DBS Digital Readiness Survey revealed almost 62% of large and middle market companies are still in the formative stages of digitalization in India. These are big numbers and point to the vastness of the cyberspace that India needs to secure. The country is also a witness to numerous cyber attacks in the past, including many soft ones. The government's ongoing Digital India push and the Reserve Bank's planned central bank digital currency may only add to the list of vulnerabilities. In December 2021, Business Standard reported that India was expected to be among the largest victims of cyber attacks in two years. Cyber attacks were projected to increase by 200% year-on-year. 
According to the Computer Emergency Response Team data, India witnessed a threefold increase in cybersecurity related incidents in 2020 compared to 2019, recording 1.16 million breaches. The number of breaches is expected to increase in 2021 and 2022. According to government sources, there has been 6,7220 recorded cybersecurity breaches till June 2021. So, is the Indian government seized of the situation at hand? Data on government cybersecurity spending paints a mixed picture. According to a Business Standard report in 2021-22, the government outspent its budgeted estimates on cybersecurity for the first time in past eight years. In its recent budget, the government said it would spend 515 crore rupees on cybersecurity in 2022-23. That's a 10 times increase compared to 2014-15. However, it also represents a reduction from the 552.3 crore rupees spent on cybersecurity as per the revised estimates of 2021-22. The government has budgeted 416 crore rupees for cybersecurity for that period. Actual government spending on cybersecurity has always remained below budgeted estimates. For example, the government had spent 88.2% of its budgeted amount on cybersecurity in 2016-17. In 2020-21, it was only able to spend 53% of the budgeted amount. Presently, the nature of the war in Ukraine indicates that India needs to review its cyber defense policies. The country also needs to give equal attention to building a deterrent cyber offensive capability. The government is taking far too long in finalizing a national cyber security strategy. Cyber security is a challenge for any nation, right? And for governments to respond to it, it is uh, challenging. Uh, let's not be under the notion that India does not have offensive capability. Uh, significant investments over a long period of time has gone into um, you know, many significant abilities of the Indian government and the Indian military uh, in uh, both defensive and offensive. Uh, obviously, the offensive capabilities are not in public domain uh, and uh, the government does leverage the private sector for many of the initiatives. Um, unfortunately, we are not completely aware of what those capabilities are. Now, the question may be that how um, do we ensure that uh, the private sector responds, follows protocols, informs CERT, informs the relevant organizations and their entire hierarchy of responding that they have been hit by certain attacks. And um, unfortunately, the nature of such attacks is that they happen extremely quickly. The only way uh, forward is to make sure that we keep doing drills, we keep enhancing the, the ability for the private sector to respond uh, and coordinate because there's a whole issue of coordination. Um, I think we need to have um, you know, drills equal into the, to the fire drills that we have in buildings. So we need to have war gaming on the cyber front, which is uh, missing from what we are able to piece together in the public domain. In a recent editorial, Business Standard pointed out two limitations in India's present approach. At present, the country's policy is defensive and has a narrow focus. It aims to harden vulnerabilities only in civil government and military assets. However, a substantial amount of critical infrastructure in India is built and managed by the private sector. Private corporations also hold troves of sensitive personal data. Therefore, any new strategy must ensure the private sector has necessary cybersecurity cover. The new strategy must also acknowledge that the capacity to counter attack is often the best defense in a cyber war. Yaar, mat pooch yaar. Fir se stocks mein pas gaya. To stocks ke saath bonds, insurance, gold mein balance kar. Isme bahut taam jaam hai. Tujhe five paisa nahi pata. Ab to sabko pata hai. Five paisa hai all in one account. Download five paisa now. Ab to sabko pata hai. Investing made easy and rewarding with five paisa. Investments in securities market are subject to market risks. Read all the related documents carefully before investing. With Brent crude hovering around $130 per barrel, its highest level since 2008, 
multiple sectors have started feeling the heat of subsequent raw material inflation. Among the impacted sectors, chemicals is reeling under the pressure just when it had begun coping from the pandemic-induced challenges. Their stocks continue to tumble, so should investors lap up shares after this correction or wait? Watch our next report to find out. The undercurrents of Ukraine-Russia war are being felt across economies. From oil to wheat to chemicals, every commodity is seeing a spurt in its price amid clogged supply chains. Chemical sector for one had just begun to see a turnaround gaining ground from COVID-19-induced increased logistics and freight charges and China plant shutdowns. The Ukrainian crisis, however, has sprung up worries for the sector yet again as analysts say margins of related companies will be impacted in the near term. Concerns arise as crude oil is a key raw material for many players, the prices of which are inching towards record high levels. That apart, depreciation of the Indian rupee versus Chinese renminbi also implies higher competitiveness of chemical exporters who are in direct competition with Chinese players. These concerns have also dented the stock's performance on the bourses. Stocks of Deepak Nitrite, NOCIL and Alkyl Amines have tumbled up to 26% on a year-to-date basis. In comparison, the Sensex benchmark has fallen 6% while the BSC mid and small cap indices have shed around 10% each. But should investors lap up shares after this correction? According to AK Prabhakar, despite the cool-off in prices, the sector will not be able to deliver good performance, at least in the short to medium term. Chemical companies will not perform for next one, one and a half years. No, because you know, every company is you now, uh, uh, they are expanding. So their margins will have an impact. So their profitability will have an impact. But if you are looking at three to five years, then you know, for me, most of the companies are looking good. No, they are looking at G. Chokalingam of Equinomics Research two cautions against crude dependent companies from a near term perspective. For example, uh, lubricant like there is a Savita oil, Gulf oil. You know, they use base oil, uh, which is like Atta from wheat, you know, not much value addition from crude oil to base oil. So one can say they use a, you know as good as uh, crude oil. So they are the first one to be affected, you know, the base, uh, the people who make uh, lubricants and all. Second, petrochemical companies like uh, Plims Carbon. There are many petrochemical companies. They start with uh, you know the derivatives of crude oil, uh, pitalic and nitride, iron gas, which uses styrene, which is from the crude oil. So, so the first is the uh, direct user of uh, you know oil in terms of uh, base oil. And now, second, petrochemical where the intensity of uh, oil derivative is very high. You know, you not only have uh, input price hike, uh, the economic growth itself will uh, come down, you know. So, because of this uh, war situation, you know, uh, the disruptions, the growth will start correcting. And uh, the first two set of companies which make, uh, you know, oil, uh, uh, which are dependent on crude oil um, or uh, petrochemical companies, they are highly linked to the uh, economic growth. So for them, you know, both ways it will be impacted. So the first two categories one should avoid for time being. That said, not all is bad for the sector. Analysts say companies that use substitutes of oil derivatives such as India Glycol will benefit from rising oil prices as they use renewable energy. Specialty chemicals too look attractive at this point in time as valuations are inexpensive and companies look better placed to handle the current increase in crude prices. That apart, chemical companies involved in backward integration and those offering niche products such as Army Organic and Clean Science Technologies are great long-term bet. According to Kotak Institutional Equities, Indian specialty companies are better equipped today to handle raw material volatility given presence in more downstream and specialized product, increased scale and growing dependency of global customers on Indian players. The brokerage expects companies with low dependence on crude such as Naveed Florine, SRF, RT Industries and PI Industries to be least impacted as they have the ability to pass higher input costs. Apart from chemicals, other oil-linked stocks will continue to be in focus on Thursday as energy prices remain volatile. Moreover, developments from Russia-Ukraine conflict, US inflation data, the European Central Bank's monetary policy meeting and assembly election results back home will guide the indices today. अब क्या किया? शेयर्स में ट्रेडिंग।
तुम्हें फाइव पैसा नहीं पता ओए, अब तो सबको पता है फाइव पैसा पर मिलते हैं रिसर्च टूल्स पोर्टफोलियो एनालिटिक्स और इन्वेस्टमेंट आइडियाज भी डाउनलोड फाइव पैसा ना अब तो सबको पता है इन्वेस्टिंग मेड इजी एंड रिपोर्टिंग विद फाइव पैसा इन्वेस्टमेंट इन सिक्योरिटीज मार्केट आर सब्जेक्ट टू मार्केट रिस्क रीड ऑल द रिलेटेड डॉक्यूमेंट्स केयरफुली बिफोर इन्वेस्टिंग The Russian attack on Ukraine not just highlighted Vladimir Putin's growing clout in the region, but also turned some spotlight on a bunch of billionaire businessmen, often referred to as the President's Men. Part of Putin's inner circle, they are now facing a litany of sanctions from the West, which calls this kind of governance an oligarchy and not a democracy. But do you know the difference between these two? Or for that matter, what is an autocracy or a monarchy? Watch our next report. The United States imposed another round of sanctions on 50 Russian oligarchs and their families last week, a move that was clearly aimed at President Vladimir Putin. All of them are said to be part of Putin's inner circle and use their money and influence to shield him from any harm. The UK too announced somewhat similar sanctions against them. The European Union has also said that it would sanction more than two dozen Russian oligarchs. But what exactly is an oligarch? The word oligarchy has Greek origins. It comes from a combination of the word oligos, which means few, and archo, which means to rule or to command. Any societal power structure where the ruling power lies in the hands of a small number of privileged people can be broadly categorized as an oligarchy. And these people in power in turn are known as oligarchs. In the Russian context, Western media uses the term oligarch to refer to very rich Russian business leaders who have a great deal of political influence, especially those who are close to President Putin. There are several kinds of oligarchies. Take the example of an aristocracy, which means a system where the nobles rule. Then there is plutocracy, a system where the wealthy rule. and then there is technocracy a system where technical experts or educated people rule russia is also categorized as an autocracy in some quarters in an autocracy the supreme authority or power to rule is in the hands of one individual or entity external authorities and even the people have no say in the decisions taken by the said individual or entity autocracy includes dictatorship There are two kinds of dictatorships. One is civilian dictatorship and the other is a military dictatorship like the one we saw in Pakistan on several occasions. Civilian dictatorship is a form of governance where absolute power is in the hands of a civilian. Here the ruling dictator does not derive his power from the military. On the other hand, in a military dictatorship, the military exerts complete or at least substantial control over political authority in the country. Here the dictator is quite often a high-ranked military officer. Autocracy also includes absolute monarchy. Some examples of absolute monarchy are Saudi Arabia, Oman and Brunei. In an absolute monarchy, a family or a group of families also called royalty rules the country. In such a system, the monarch's power is not limited by laws or legislation. Also, the post of the monarch is hereditary. And then there is Ukraine. which has been hailed as a country that is bravely fighting to preserve its democracy in a democracy the country's people are involved in selecting its leadership or head the people play a crucial and deciding role in the process of forming the government in such a system people have the right to vote for any party or political representative to bring them to power the primary goal of a democracy is to ensure that the leaders govern through fair representation We Indians disagree on everything, but we agree SBI is the banker to every Indian. अरे SBI contactless debit card. I agree. SBI is the banker to every Indian. A 2014 study conducted by two prominent U.S. political scientists concluded that America was also an oligarchy. They argued that the influence of economic elites and big business far outstripped that of ordinary citizens. That's all we have for you today. For more news and analysis, log on to businessstandard.com. We'll be back tomorrow with our next episode. Thank you for watching.
If you like this video, share it and subscribe to Business Standard. For more news, views and insights, log on to www.business-standard.com. Do also follow us on YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Telegram and LinkedIn.